It is my gr great pleasure to welcome you tonight, and I hope that you can learn something about the breadth and the width of Christianity as a world religion. In one hour and 10 minutes to leave some time for questions and answers, and I will lecture around one hour, one hour, 10 minutes. I can only give you a little bit a teaser of what the study of world Christianity is about. This lecture is about a tremendous shift in global Christianity that took place in the past 100 years. This shift has changed our traditional ways of doing and of understanding theology. This lecture now is about the different aspects of this shift and about the shifts in theology and Christian studies. The lecture will consist of five parts. What I will do first is to give you a short description of some of the demographic shifts that happened in global Christianity in the past century. I will then in the next step describe how the field of studies in world Christianity developed and thirdly, what typical questions of this field are. I will then in a fourth step describe three features among the many features that, that give us a glimpse of what world Christianity is about. And I will then end the whole lecture uh, and I will end with a very short academic with a very short academic um, and uh, contextual reflection on the conclusion. I expect the whole lecture to take a bit more than one hour and this will leave us sufficient time for question and answer. Okay. When we discuss Christianity as a world religion, we often start with the year 1910. This was the year when the first significant worldwide conference of Christians came together to discuss matters of joint concern. It was the World Mission Conference in Edinburgh, which is usually regarded as the birth hour of the modern ecumenical movement. If you could zoom in on the picture of this assembly, you would see that more than 98% of the participants were from the West, most of them older men. I don't actually know whether there were women among the participants, but 98% were from the West. Only 17, or just about 1.5%, were from the majority world, from the so-called younger churches. Famously, of them, uh, among them, Cheng Qingyi from China and V.S. Azariah from India. V.S. Azariah made a famous call to the conference where he called for new relations among Christians worldwide. He said, <clears throat> I quote him, through all the ages to come, the Indian church will rise up in gratitude to attest the heroism and self-denying labors of the missionary body. You have given your goods to feed the poor. You have given your bodies to be burned. We also ask for love, give us friends. So what we see here is that he was calling for equal relationships between the missionaries and uh, or the traditionally mission sending countries and the traditionally mission receiving countries uh, or the major in the majority world. Until the middle of the 20th century, the ecumenical movement remained dominated by participants from the West, as you can see in these two charts, with only a small number of participants from Asia or Africa. So you see here on the left-hand side, the participants in the International Missionary Council, that is roughly the, the International Ecumenical Mission Movement. And on the right-hand side, you see the Faith and Order and the Life and Work me, um, Movement. These are like the three pillars that then built in 1948, the World Council of Churches. You see in green, these are the uh, participants um, 
No, these are the total participants, and in brown are those from younger churches here on the right. Here on the left, you see those in blue from Asia and those in green overall. Um, so you see uh, very much dominated by, um, by people not from the Western churches. Today, <clears throat> the situation has radically changed. Although global Christian world conferences are still dominated by elderly men, church leaders, the overall picture is, in short, younger, more gender balanced, and more geographically and ethnically balanced. In other words, the face of world Christianity has changed. Now, this is a world map <clears throat> that illustrates something of the shifts that happened in global Christianity in the past 100 years or so. Now, let us study this map a bit more thoroughly. This map comes from the Boston Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell uh, Theological Seminary. This is a study center that also publishes the World Christian Database and the World Christian Encyclopedia. They are important sources for ma any material related to world Christianity. And many people who relate to this field of studies will uh, make reference to these sources. They are good sources, but we should always remember they are fallible. They, are, they may have be wrong. They have, in my opinion, a tendency of presenting rather too high numbers. So be careful when you quote numbers and don't, don't take them simply for face value. I will come back to this warning about numbers. But having said this, note of caution, we may still use their material as also other material that exists as offering sufficiently good indication of trends. And as such, you should take it. Now, let us first note that the total annual average growth rate, A-H-E-R in short, of Christianity in the 20th century is 2.02%. Per, uh, percent. Uh, this stands next to an annual average growth rate of the whole population of 1.1%. So that means that Christianity has grown by 1% per year more than the population has grown. Um, if this is correct from the numbers that I, that I have received uh, from various sources. Now that what we see here in this map is the situation of world religions in the year 2010 namely the majority religion province by province in percentage. Now, let me quickly go to another, um, to another uh, chart where we can see things a little bit more uh, precisely. Uh, this is the file that will be also uploaded on the, in the chat room, so you can download it for you and you can play with it and study it a little bit more. Now, what we see here is the majority, yeah, the majority religion province by province in percentage. That means the color indicates the majority religion in a specific province. Blue stands for Christian, green for Islam, pink for Hindu, brown for Buddhist, light brown or pinkish for agnostic, and so on. And then the color tone, lighter or darker, indicates the percentage. In short, the darker the color, the higher the percentage. Now, what we see is an obvious picture of Christianity dominating the Americas, Europe, North Asia. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, uh, uh, Europe, North Asia, um, uh, South uh, Americas, uh, North and South America, and then also Sub-Saharan Africa, um, very importantly, and Australia and Oceania. On the other side, Islam is clearly dominating all of North Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia. That Hinduism dominates India, Buddhism, Southeast Asia is surely known. I guess so far this is all this is all well known. You will find uh, the file uh, the file from where I got this in the Zoom chat, and there you may um, zoom in more if you want to learn more. Now, what makes this map? Interesting is, in my opinion, two points. 
Um, what is fascinating first is to see the small patches that contrast the overall picture. For instance, you have Suriname here in Latin America. Uh, this is where a lot of Indian immigrants live. Or the patches of blue, that is Christianity in Northeast India, here at the border to Myanmar, um, and possibly also should also be partly in Myanmar, um, or also in Sarawak here, that is Sarawak in uh, uh, Eastern Malaysia. These small patches of land tell interesting stories of local particularities that emerged through global religious and political relations. They mostly go together either with different patterns of evangelization or with migratory movements. For instance, uh, a large number of Christians or of people from one specific re religion migrating to another place or with regional conflicts between minority groups and a hegemonial majority, often it is, or often it is ethnic minorities who turned to Christianity in contrast to the different majority belief of their neighbors. If we could further zoom in, not just on provincial level, but county or village level, we could see many, many more dots in different co colors. So the image would be even more diverse. But of course, these small states tell interesting stories of how Christianity developed in contrast to the majority religion in the neighboring area. Now, another interesting point is uh, if we go to this small inlaid, uh, inlaid, where is it? I have to find it quickly. Uh, sorry. Here the inlaid. Uh, I have to maybe go back into the to the main picture to my PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, here uh, this inlaid picture of 1910. Uh, what we see here is again several things. First, we see an overall picture then of religious bloc being more hom homogeneous. So in 1910, the religious landscape is much, much more homogeneous. Uh, that's the first thing. We see most of North America, Europe and Australia in darker blue then in lighter colors, colors today. That means today less dominated by Christianity than compared to 100 years ago. And most remarkable, we see how within 100 years, Christianity became the dominant religion in sub-Saharan Africa. So all this, what is kind of uh, purple or dark red here, that would mean these are ethnic religions or uh, for, uh, popular religions. They have all turned blue and partly dark blue in one in the map of 2010. So this is the most remarkable change that we can see. But we can also see that, that Christianity developed significantly in those parts that were before dominated by the so-called ethno-religionists, that is popular religions or traditional religion, tribal religions or whatever it is called. That Christianity did not make any inroads in areas that were dominated by another major religion, such as Islam, Hinduism, or Buddhism, is equally something that we can see here. So if you look, for instance, at this, at the, the Islamic world, you will see that the, actually Islam equally expanded southwards in um, Africa and also uh, expanded possibly a little bit also in Southeast Asia. Now, you see that I've further added this kind of dot, Timbuktu. Um, now, what does Timbuktu stand for? Timbuktu is a city here in um, somewhere central Mali. I have never been there. Uh, it is at the fringes of the Great Sahara Desert, uh, a dry place in the midst of an area that is dominantly following Islam. So this is in the midst of the Islamic uh, area. Um, I have only been nearby there, but never really in Timbuktu. Now, Timbuktu stands for the so-called new center of gravity of world Christianity. That means there is an equal number of Christians east and west, south and north of Timbuktu. So that is the new center of gravity of Christianity in the uh, 21st century. 
Now, the center of gravity of world Christianity has been shifting first from the Middle East, nor north and westwards, and more recently, southwards. Or in other words, the typical Christian today is not an old European man, but the young woman from Nigeria or from the Philippines. This is what this map really is, is about. It is about the shift of the center of gravity from the north to the south. Now, in this picture, we, see, we may see this picture in another form in this slide. We see people walking out of the church in Europe and North America, 4,300 people, according to this uh, slide, uh, uh, every day. Huh? And on the other hand side, we see people entering the church in Africa, according to this slide, uh, 16,500 uh, every day. Now, the latter number makes more than up for the decline of Christianity in the West. However, I also like to use this picture to again warn you about numbers and about taking numbers at face value. The source of this graphic presentation is actually a good source. It is the Asbury Theological Seminary in the US uh, uh, that stands in the good Methodist tradition, a good theological school, actually. Yet some of these numbers are clearly flawed. Here in the uh, right uh, lower corner, um, you can see a number that claims that in China every day, um, 6, 16,500 uh, new Christians turn to Christ every day. Maybe this is just a typo because there was already this 16,500 up here. But if you take this for face value, that would means, mean that uh, 6 million become Christian every year in China alone, which means 60 million every decade. And I think although China has been one of the countries with the most significant growth, growth rates in world Christianity, this is by far too much, 60 million more Christian in one decade. Still, we use this uh, chart simply to give us a rough illustration of trends, even if they are not fully accurate. So what we see here, again, summarizingly said, people, walking out of the church in Europe and North America, and more of them, more people walking into the church in Africa, and we could also say in China and in many other places. Now, let, let me look at this chart here. Here we see the changes in world, world Christianity in more detail, with here first on the left-hand side, African Christianity growing significantly from 10% in 1910 to 46% of the population in 2010. Every small square represents 1%. And then we have um, North America and um, North and South American Christianity, which slightly declines, but with a very, still very high majority of the population being Christian. We have Europe, which where Christianity is declining considerably, and with agnostics, this uh, yellow-brown, uh, advancing, yet with still a large majority of Christianity, even today. Then if we look at Asia, there the picture is much more complex and also more interesting somehow. We see a growth of Christianity, from the blue here, from 2% to 8% in 100 years. Now, this is, in certain ways, quite amazing because we could say this is well a quadruple of the number uh, uh, yeah a 400 percent increase in 100 years um still though on a very low number um we see also the growth of islam in asia from 16 percent of the whole asian population to 26 percent and the third group that is significantly growing is the category of agnostics, which grew from nothing to 12%. Of course, it mainly refers to places where atheism is the official teaching of the state. The growth of religions in Asia goes of, of Christianity, but also of uh, agnostics and of uh, um, Islam, um, goes at the, mainly at the expense of the category of Chinese folk religionists, which Asia-wide declined from 38% to 40% in 
to 11%. This is obviously foremost an issue in China. But the same happens across Southeast Asia, where Christianity has had a strong impact on Chinese community, uh, communities in Indonesia or in Thailand or in Malaysia, but less on the other people in these countries. In short, we can say that in 1910, 80% of the world's Christians lived in Europe and North America. 100 years later, in 2010, 60% of the world's Christians live in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The churches and theology reacted slowly. We still regard, the, um, we still regard Western theology and Christianity as somehow normative. And until very recently, or possibly even today, Western leaders still play a major role that is disproportionate to their numerical size. For instance, it was only in 1960 that the Catholic Church consecrated the first African Catholic bishop. But meanwhile, we have a pope from Argentina, and we may have a next one from Nigeria or the Philippines or elsewhere. The days that the pope had to be from Italy, as in the past several centuries, seems to be definitely over. Note that this I cannot emphasize strongly enough that Christianity has always been a world religion, but it was not always perceived as such. Yes, the reality has also changed as Christianity has become more diverse and more global, but more important, the perception of Christianity has changed. Still, many people regard Christianity as a Western religion, but this is a biased narrative that people use for various reasons. Sometimes, it is used by political leaders opposed to Christianity to say that this is foreign to us in Asia. And partly it is perceived as a Western religion because indeed Christian missionaries from the West sometimes behaved as if Christianity were something Western. Thus the common Chinese saying, Do yakko gedo to siu yakko honya. Uh, that's a, a sentence that I could still hear some people tell me uh, just a few years ago, which is, of course, uh, nonsense if you look at the reality, but still it is a kind of a, a perception of some people. So we should remember, and this is also part of the study of Christianity as world religion, that this perception of Christianity as a Western religion is historically possibly understandable, but totally wrong. Christianity, if ever, is very much an Asian religion. It grew out of Asia, out of Israel, which solidly belongs to West Asia, even though at its fringes. But Israel is clearly part of Asia. In this map, you can see how Christianity, from its very earliest time, grew into three different directions. Keep this in mind because there are still some narratives who talk about Christianity steadily moving in a Western direction, moving around the globe until it reaches East Asia from where it continues to move westward until the journey of the gospel around the globe comes to an end. This is the narrative of the Chinese back to Jerusalem movement that who describes the move, movement of the gospel as a westward movement until it reaches China and from there the Chinese bring it back to Israel. Um, it is a nice narrative, a nice idea, but it is historical nonsense. Since its earliest time, Christianity spread in all directions towards the, towards the east, towards the south, and towards the west. It is just that the um, that the yeah, the Acts and some of the, uh, yeah, the, the Pauline letters, letters of Paul, mainly focused on the Roman Empire. But we know that there was equally early uh, extensions towards what is nowadays Iraq, Iran, Syria, uh, anyway, Iraq, Iran, and even uh, probably um, India. Yeah, so this is what we can see here. Now, these numbers show how in the year 500, nearly half of the world's Christian population actually lived in Asia, 21.2%. Huh? Um, mostly in, uh, sorry, 21.2 million uh, out of 43.4 million. 
mostly, of course, in West Asia, but partly also beyond. The center of gravity of world Christianity would at the time uh, roughly have been somewhere in today's Syria. Even by the year 800, Christianity's center of gravity was only about to move west and northwards, but it took another few centuries for Christianity to establish itself firmly as centered in the West. The continuous decline of Christianity in, in Africa after 500 is mainly due to the expansion of Islam in Northern Africa. Several factors played a role in the fast advance of Islam. One factor was, of course, the military superiority of the Islamic forces. Interesting for us is another factor, namely the dividedness of Christianity after Chalcedon, which made the non-Chalcedonian Christians, the so-called monophysites, but also the so-called Nestorians, or the Assyrian Church of the East, the, um, made them kind of uh, opposed to so-called Orthodox Christianity, which was supported by the emperor of the Roman Empire. These non-Orthodox Christians thus welcomed the Islamic conquest as preferable to control by the Roman emperor. The significant decline of Christianity in Asia, uh, the most significant decline happened after um, 1200. It was a consequence of the end of the Mo Mongolian Yuan dynasty in China, which had relatively good relationships to Christianity and also uh, a consequence of the rule of Tamerlane in the 14th century, who eradicated much of Christianity in Asia. Okay, that was my first part. Now let us look at how this field of study developed. I want to simply name a few people who contributed significantly to this emerging field of study. One of the first who studied world Christianity was a Swiss Catholic monk, Walbert Bühlmann, who first wrote a book on this subject in the 1970s. The other one is on Protestant side, Andrew Walls, who founded the Center for the Study of World Christianity in 1982, which is now in Edinburgh. There were some others, particularly people related to the World Council of Churches, but these two are a bit regarded like the fathers of this emerging field within Christian studies. Our third person is uh, to note is David Barrett. He is an important figure in this field. He was originally an engineer and then became a missionary in Kenya. Um, he started to travel to over 200 countries and started to reach, research Christianity in all these places. And he began to quantify, quantify world religion, uh, Christianity. This then led to the first edition of the World Christian Encyclopedia in 1982. So his contribution is really the quantification of world Christianity and the quantitative statistical knowledge about the change in the worldwide religious landscape. The person who really popularized the field was Philip Jenkins, who teaches at Baylor in the US. His books uh, like uh, The Next Christendom, The Coming of Global Christianity, and The New Faces of Christianity, Believing the Bible in the Global South, are really highly readable. I can, they became bestsellers and uh, inspired many readers. So much of what Jenkins wrote was actually known before him, but he was really the one who, through his good writing style, brought it to the attention of a wide audience. Since then, scholarship has greatly extended. An important African scholar was Lamin Sané, who taught at Yale and who just recently passed away. He emphasized that the Christian faith is a translated and a translating faith. As such, it is a form of indigenous empowerment by virtue of translation into the various languages of the world. Um, I would indeed emphasize that the Christian contribution to the preservation of languages should be undoubted and is very important. Then another one is Dana Robert, um, who contributed much to the study of women in mission and the relation between, between mission and world Christianity. She also authored a highly readable book on how Christianity became a world religion. So this may inspire you to read more. Other important scholars are Lal Sankima Pachuao from Northeast India, 
where several states are predominantly Christian, he now teaches at Asbury in a theological seminary in the US. Another one is Hanchiles, Jehu Hanchiles from Sierra Leone, who is the, teaches also in the uh, US. Um, then there were contributions from of important non-Western theologians, among them Kwame Bediaku uh, from Ghana, whom you see in this picture, and then of course closer to home, Aloysius Pieris from Sri Lanka, Kozuke Koyama from Japan, uh, or who was a longtime missionary in Thailand, or uh, CS Song from Taiwan. Here is a list uh, of a few important scholarly in, uh, institutions engaged in the study of world uh, Christianity. The most important one is, is among them is the Center for the Study of Global Christianity that I have already mentioned. And they have an important um, tool, the World Christian Database. Maybe uh, if you have access to, um, let me see, to some, uh, to the library of the Chinese University or some other libraries, you may possibly get access to it. You can play around with this um, uh, with this database. There's tons of information. You can look at all religions globally and then get to this here. You can compare how these different religions uh, developed, or you can look at uh, all different countries from Afghanistan to Zambia, I guess. Um, so there's plenty of information that you can find there. Uh, very interesting. So I welcome you to, uh, if you have a chance to look into this. Then you have the Center for the Study of World Christianity in Edinburgh uh, that published the studies in world Christianity, uh, uh, an important um, journal on world Christianity. Then you have the Nagel Institute uh, at Calvin University in Michigan, the uh, studies, the Overseas Ministry Study Center in Princeton that published the International Bulletin of Missionary Research. You have a Center for Christianity Worldwide in Cambridge and a few others. So these are all important centers. Uh, and then we, of course, have also Christian organizations. Um, they also contribute to the study and the practice of Christianity as world religion. Foremost, of course, we should may first mention the Roman Catholic Church which has all along understood itself as a global body and also or organizationally connects Christians around the world. Um, and then we have, um, yeah, important scholars there are Robert Schreiter and Stephen Bevins. We have the World Council of Churches in Geneva, which is one of the oldest and most important organizations connecting Christians around the world, uh, including um, non-Catholic, traditional Christian denominations like Protestants, Orthodox, but also the uh, Assyrian Church of the East or the, some non-Chalcedonian churches. Then we have the Lausanne movement, a mission movement that is very much representing evangelicals. They connect rather people than churches. And we have traditional mission organizations that also um, contribute a lot to the practice of world Christianity. Here I have a few discussion of a few um, terminological issues due to uh, time uh, concerns. Maybe I leave this out for this moment and I move on to the next slide first. We can come back to that. Uh, I would like now to move to the third part to some of the important questions that the study of Christianity as a world religion deals with. We should remember studies in world Christianity is a new field of study that radically changed the traditional mode of studying theology and of understanding Christianity. It brings us a paradigm change in the perception of Christianity. When I studied theology uh, 30 or something years ago, um, I only studied about European theology, Western theology, uh, mostly German-speaking theology, and nowadays, you cannot study theology like that, N not in Asia, of course, but not also not in Europe. You have to be aware of the worldwide dimension of Christianity. And we should note that much of the studies of in world Christianity are not done by theologians, but by people from humanities and social sciences. Much of this field is related to social studies and to anthropological studies. 
studies. Theology comes in at the second level of reflection. I will come back to that. Now, one of the areas that scholars of world Christianity discuss is how Christianity as world religion actually looks like. While large parts of Western Christianity has developed in engaging with the heritage of the Enlightenment, the situation in the majority world is different. Here, Christianity appears overwhelmingly conservative, biblical, um, but as we all know, there is also a liberationist and progressive dimension to it. Famous is, of course, the liberation theology from Latin America that was strongly received in academic circles around the world. Or also related to, to the question of how Christianity as world religion looks like, how much is Christianity in the global south shaped by the missionary heritage? And how much is it shaped by local appropriation? Then another question, what are the sources of the Christian faith? Of course, as elsewhere, the Bible and the tradition are important source, sources. But what about the different social and cultural context? What about the different personal experiences of people in the global south, many of them living in context of poverty or of religious persecution? It is obvious that these different contexts and experiences shape their theologies and give rise to different theologies. Another typical area of questioning is what are the forms of expression? In traditional theology, the theology expressed itself dominantly in books or in scholarly articles. As we study world Christianity, we rediscover the multitude, multiple forms of expression from sermons to pamphlets, testimonies, songs, dance to proverbs and physical buildings. An interesting question that goes more to the heart of our faith is when it comes to the sacraments. Does the sacrament of the Eucharist need to be bread and wine if the local culture does not cultivate wine? As for instance, in the Philippines, where wine needs to be imported. Or what about baptism? Of course, we think that water is a universal symbol of cleansing. But in some culture, as for instance in the Maasai culture in Kenya, pouring water over the head of a woman means to curse her. This is a story that Stephen Bevins tells in his book, Models of Contextual Theology. So we should be aware that sac even sacraments may need to be contextualized. I mean, this is an open theological question. Another question of world Christian st Christianity studies is what are the forms of doing theology? Our traditional theology was for the past centuries university or seminary based and expressed in discursive forms as lecture, as monograph, as scholarly writing. Now we realize that theology can also express itself in other forms, in hymns, in homilies, in testimonies or in video clips. Then, a lot of studies relate to the question of how do religious shifts affect society? Will the growth of Christian, Christian faith in a society lead to an advancement of political reforms? Will it possibly lead to more democracy? Or maybe growth in Christianity may have negative in, impacts, for instance, in the form of persecutions of sexual minorities based on the Christian faith. Studies showed that the widespread persecution of sexual minorities in some African countries have been triggered by global Christian connections and by US-based evangelicals campaigning for anti-gay policies in Africa. Then, how do global religious shifts impact international political relations? Some of you may remember a book published two decades ago uh, with the title Jesus in Beijing, where an Amer American journalist speculated about the growth of Christianity leading to significant change in the geopolitical configuration, as the growth in Christianity in China would influence Chinese international relations, for instance, in China's relationship to the West or in, in its relations to Israel. Now, this is, of course, uh, 
very questionable and it did not materialize until now, but it is indeed an interesting question. On the other side, the growth of Christianity may also trigger more internal and international conflicts, as for instance in Nigeria, where there is increasing tension between the, between the Muslim-dominated North and the Christian-dominated South. Another question is, what are reasons for the success of Christianity in various places? And we should not forget that Christianity is not always growing, but also may be de declining. Typical areas where Christianity is strongly growing in Asia, according to an US-based evangelical mission agency, are China, Nepal, and Cambodia. Again, we have to be careful about these numbers, as evangelical agencies sometimes tend to a certain triumphalism. But then again, even if not fully accurate, they may point to some trends. You see here in green, in green the net Christian annual average growth rate. Uh, so that's kind of, we could say the difference between the red and the green is the true is indeed the conversion rate or the, the, the increase. Um, now, of course, answers for the, the reasons for the growth of Christianity vary uh, from context to context, and we may distinguish push and pull factors, that is, social factors that push people to turn to the Christian faith, and pull factors, that is, factors inherent in Christianity that attract people to the Christian faith. Factors that lead to a growth of Christianity may be, among the many, liberalization of political, the political environment, or a political change overall, possibly increased exchanges with the outside world. A lot has been said about reasons for Christian growth in China over the past 40 years. And indeed, Christianity grew by an average of around 10% until around 2010. I'm not sure about the growth since then. I do not know in, uh, much about the situation in Nepal, but I could imagine that one of the reasons for the growth of Christianity in Nepal is that overseas Nepali Christians reach out to their home country and kind of evangelize them. Another reason may be that Nepal, which is landlocked there between the superpowers India and China, may um, kind of turn to the Christian faith in order to distance itself from its dominant political neighbor India, uh, uh, which is dominated by the Hindu faith. Finally, very much a theological question is the question, what are in a more diverse Christian community as the worldwide Christian community is, what are the criteria for the Orthodox Christian faith? Or in other words, what holds us together as Christians from uh, across the world? For instance, for many Protestant Christians, the teaching about justification by faith alone has been a core element of their belief. Yet some theologians suggested that this is a contextual belief of Protestant Christians in Germany or in Western Europe. It is typically the teaching that uh, became dominant by Martin Luther. One theologian who suggested so was Bishop Ting, Ting Guangfan, uh, Guangfan who instead suggested to regard the belief in God, who is love, as the core of the Christian faith. The Roman Catholic theologian Robert Schreiter wrote a famous book on local theologies. In this book, he spelled out five criteria that makes a locally developed theology orthodox, that means meaningfully part of the worldwide Christian community. His first criterion is inner consistency, that means is a specific Christian teaching consistent with the rest of the Christian teaching? For instance, a teaching that marginalizes one group of people as less than fully human cannot pass the test of orthodox orthodoxy. A second criterion is whether a specific local teaching can be translated into worship. A third criterion is the criterion of orthopraxis, for instance, a theology that justifies oppression of workers or oppression of women would fail this test as much as a theology of liberation that calls 
for violent action. A fourth criterion is that the local theology should be open to criticism from other churches. Is a local theology able and willing to engage in dia dialogue with other local theologies? This is a, cru a crucial aspect of ecumenical theology. A final criterion that is closely related to the fourth criterion is whether a local theology has the strength to challenge other theologies. That means to actively contribute to the dialogue between Christians. Let us now talk about a few features of world Christianity. Due, due to our limited time, I only want to mention three features at this point. There could be many, many more, of course, but these three features that I will mention are very important uh, in my opinion. The first feature is the tremendous rise of Pentecostalism in the past century. In the early 20th century, several revival uh, revivals in various parts of the world happened and they brought about a Pentecostal charismatic movement that has taken on various forms throughout the past century and contributed much to the worldwide strength of Christianity and to its success in adapting to new contexts. Pentecostalism would in itself deserve an extended lecture or more, so I cannot say too much here. What I simply want to emphasize is that meanwhile, many of the world's largest congregations are Pentecostal, many of them in South Korea, but also in Singapore, in Nigeria, in Brazil, in the Philippines, etc. Most of you have seen pictures of the famous Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, the world's single largest congregation with a weekly worship attendance of around 200,000 people. We should note, though, that not all mega churches of the world are Pentecostal. Interestingly, in Hong Kong, the largest churches are rather evangelical than Pentecostal. Many of these churches spread throughout the world, not so much like new denominations, but, but rather like global brands and networks. I don't want to engage in speculation about the numbers of Pentecostals worldwide, worldwide because it very much depends on whom we include in the mo movement. Um, uh, but uh, out of, uh, of the plane, I want to rather discuss what are the factors in the, of the, in the growth of Pentecostalism in the majority world. I just want to mention a few ones here. Pentecostal Christianity grew particularly in areas where it entered the context of folk religious practices because it shares a similar worldview with beliefs in demonic forces and supernatural interventions. Some people speak in this context of Pentecostalism as Christianized form of popular beliefs. For instance, in the context of Korea, some scholars say that there is an effective affinity, uh, sorry, an elective affinity between traditional shamanism and Pentecostalism, or in other words, Pentecostalism is the resurgence of shamanism in Christianized form. Similarly, there is an elective affinity between Presbyterianism, or we may say evangelicalism, and Confucianism, or uh, Presbyterianism is the resurgence of Confucian, Presbyterianism is the resurgence of Confucianism in Christianized form. Another reason for Pentecostalism's success is its concern for practical, practical impacts. It aims at tangible impacts in the people's lives healing, prosperity, orderliness, etc. It could indeed be that the relatively good health system in Hong Kong is a factor why in the local context Pentecostalism grew less than in other contexts. One factor may be that Pentecostalism attracts many people by its holistic spirituality, which includes physical expressions and the rediscovery of ecstatic dimensions of life and of spirituality. A famous saying of, 
regarding the situation of Latin America, where Pentecostalism grew tremendously, says the Catholic Church opted for the poor. The poor opted for Pentecostalism. Uh, the Catholic Church opted for the poor, that is liberation theology. The poor opted for Pentecostalism. Indeed, Pentecostalism does offer a kind of liberation, but very different from the vision of liberation theology. While it's often conservative teaching, for instance, its classical teaching on family values stands rather in contrast to liberation, Pentecostal Christianity is successful among people at the fringes of society because it offers them very practical advice. Fathers, don't drink and be faithful. And indeed, as family fathers turn to such practice, as they stop spending the uh, their little money on drinking and petting and sexual adventures outside of the marriage, the family does indeed experience economic progress. The families do prosper. So this is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. There is a dimension of empowerment in Pentecostal churches because anyone may be anointed to speak in public, to pray or to share his or her testimony. We could say that in revivalist Pentecostal churches, the reformation principle of the priesthood of all believers is finally realized. As a summary, we may regard Pentecostal Christianity as a resurgence of a kind of Christian faith and practice where the religious experience stands at the center. This is one of the core theses of the famous book by Harvey Cox, Fire from Heaven, that uh, offers a very readable discussion of the rise of Pentecostal Christianity. I still regard this as one of the most well-written and most highly readable books on Pentecostalism. Now, a second feature of world Christianity that I, that I like to mention here is the shift in global mission. In this map, we see some of the most important missionary sending and receiving countries. While the US still sends the most missionaries worldwide, they have been clearly overtaken, not in absolute numbers, but relative to their population by, for instance, by South Korea, which has around 20,000 Protestant missionaries sent out. Today, several of the major sending countries are in the global south, among them Nigeria and the Philippines. This map, of, a map offers once more an example of how we should be critical of numbers. The map mentions here China, 15,000 missionaries, 15, missionaries from China. Now, even if this number includes the roughly 700 missionaries from Hong Kong, I do not see any evidence on the ground of such a high number of missionaries from the People's Republic of China. I have done recently some research on Chinese missionaries overseas, and I do not, there are quite a number of missionaries uh, from China active around the globe, but I never come close to the number of 15,000. What is impress, interesting is that similar to the Protestant mission of the 19th and the early 20th century, these modern mission movements have their own narratives. One typical narrative is that missionaries from the South understand their mission as bringing the, the gospel back to the North from where they received the gospel and which now ha has lost the faith. Another famous narrative is that missionaries from the South are fulfilling the journey of the gospel and bring it back to its starting point in Jerusalem. This motive has been famous in the Chinese context as the back to Jerusalem movement that I have mentioned before. Another popular mo um, motive that I encountered in my research is the motive of repaying a gospel debt. People in the majority world feel indebted to the missionary movement which brought, brought the gospel to them. They now want to repay with an equal number of missionaries. This has been a motive in the context of mission from China. Missions in the majority world emphasize that their missionaries have many advantages compared to those from the West, a more positive image than the traditional Western missionaries and less a link to unequal international 
uh, uh, political relations and neo-colonial dependency. Whether this is true may be debated. I have met many missionaries from the Global South, uh, from South Korea, from Singapore, from Hong Kong also, uh, from elsewhere, who showed little awareness of international political and economic dependencies. Also part of the shift in the global mission landscape is that clergy from the majority world serve in parishes in the north. For instance, priests from Nigeria or from, from the Philippines, from Congo, serving in European parishes. This is particularly the case in the Roman Catholic Church, which lacks local priests in many European countries. Further, as previously mentioned, several large churches developed in the majority world, which spread out across the world and now build a kind of new denominations or global brands that are headquartered in Nigeria, in South Korea, or Brazil, um, or Brazil or the Philippines. Some of these new networks also have branch churches in Hong Kong, for instance, the Nigerian Redeemed Christian Church of God, or the Korean Yoido Full Gospel Church, which also has a church in Hong Kong. Now let us move to a, a third feature of uh, world Christianity, or of this new situation in world Christianity uh, that I like to introduce. It is that the majority world is more and more setting the agenda for worldwide Christianity. A few examples shall illustrate this point. While religious persecution is not much of a topic in Europe, partly because Europeans, Christians and non-Christians alike, still carry a sense of guilt and the memory of having been active perpetrators of religious persecution, the situation is very much different in the majority world. There, many Christians experience persecution as part of their everyday reality. Another example of how Christians from the majority world are increasingly setting the agenda is in the area of gender and family issues. Conservative teachings are indeed partly imported from conservative Christian NGOs from the North, as for instance, in the case of radically anti-homosexual teachings promoted in parts of Africa, uh, for instance, in Uganda. Sc uh, scholars have shown how these teachings have been indeed imported by um, or triggered by teachings from uh, through uh, Christian NGOs from the US. However, much of it has also developed locally and independent from the West. In fact, many churches in the majority world promote traditional gender, gender roles and have a critical attitude towards liberal values. They blame liberal values for the decline of Christianity in the West and combine this criticism with an anti-colonial and anti-Western rhetoric, or they claim to preserve the heritage of missionary Christianity. A relatively broad rejection of homosexuality among Christians in the majority world reveals new tensions or new ditches in world Christianity, this time not between different denominations, but dif between different basic values or between different wor uh, worldviews. A famous example is the fierce anti-gay rhetoric of the former primate of the Anglican Church in Nigeria, Peter Akinola. His successors kept a similarly harsh position against homosexuality. Taking the shifts in world Christianity into account, the handling of such issues by global church bodies can be better understood. Concern for LGBTQ plus rights may be an issue for Christians in the West and for also a minority of Christians around the world. But for a worldwide church, such as the Roman Catholic Church, a full recognition of their, um, of their equality or of their um, appropriateness go against a majority of Christians in the global South. So we can understand why the Pope, even though he personally seems to be relatively uh, about 
homosexuality, uh, he seems unwilling ultimately to make a significant move towards homosexuals because he experiences a lot of resistance from worldwide, from, from churches in the global south. Now, let me conclude with two points, final points. First, what do we learn as students or as scholars, more on the intellectual level? The study of world Christianity primarily happens through religious studies, social science, anthropological studies, and so on. It doesn't talk about what is right and wrong. So there is no normativity included in it uh, about what is good and bad. But it introduces a wealth of stories and images, building blocks of Christianity as a world religion. As we stud study Christianity as a world religion, we first simply stand in awe before the stunning diversity of Christian faith expression and we try to understand them within their context. Now, what does this mean for us theologically and spiritually? Studying Christianity as a worldwide faith movement should teach us an attitude of ecumenical openness and humility. The world of the Christian is much richer, much more colorful, much more diverse than we thought. There is not one global theology, but only an infinite number of local theologies. An important dimension of theology is therefore to teach us how to communicate between these different local theologies. How do we ourselves articulate a theology that is respectful to other local theologies? And how can we be enriched by the encounter with other local theologies? Then a second reflection, a contextual reflection, what do we learn as people in Hong Kong? For a scholar in the studies of world Christianity, Hong Kong is a great place to be, to be because Hong Kong is home to a large variety of Christian faith expression and churches from traditional mainstream to emerging churches. There is hardly any church or any tradition or any Christian movement that is absent from Hong Kong. We have traditional Catholic and Protestant mainstream churches here, and they stand next to revivalists and, and even some very radical Christian churches. We have politically conservative Christians standing next to Christians who stand in the tradition of a liberational understanding of the gospel. We have Christians who follow a more liberal and rational faith practice and we have Christians who understand faith very much in supernatural terms. We have global brands in Christianity and we have indigenous faith expressions. We have imports from the West and a variety of contextualization. While in some places Christianity is fairly homogeneous, here in Hong Kong we have the privilege of encountering Christianity in its greatest variety. So we need definitely to learn to embrace this diversity. This is what the study of world Christianity is about. This is what the theology of world Christianity is about. So here we see in this final picture, we see some of the contextualizations of Christianity in the urban context of Hong Kong. You may yourself guess where these pictures are from, most of you should know them. Thank you so much for your attention.